Well, amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 9 this morning. It's kind of our uh, starting gun, if you will, to get this race rolling. Proverbs chapter 2, verse, I think I said 9, I meant 6. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6. If you're able, would you please stand for the reading of God's Word as we read this one proverb. Proverbs 2, verse 6. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. God is the source of wisdom. He is the one that gives wisdom. When you look in the New Testament, James has something to say about this as well. It says, if you desire wisdom, ask of God. And he will give it to you freely. He wants to give you his wisdom if you seek it. But establishing this as the groundwork for our message today, God is the source of all godly wisdom. He is the source. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity again that we have to be here to worship you, Lord. I pray over the next 30 minutes or so. Lord, that you would remove distractions from this place, bind Satan from this place, God. And I pray that your Holy Spirit will move among us, in us, and about us as we open your word and proclaim it. God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, open our eyes that we might see, in our ears that we might hear what you have for us this morning, so that we might encounter you in this place and leave here knowing that we have been in your presence beyond any shadow of a doubt. For we ask it in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. As you're being seated, turn back with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now, if you're just joining us, or if you have forgotten, like I often do from week to week, we have just begun a new sermon series called Paul's Letters to Corinth. In fact, this is just the third message in that series. So you're getting in on the ground floor here this morning as you gather here in Calvary Baptist Church. We are going to, over the next several weeks and months, go systematically through Paul's letters to the Corinthian church, starting with, of course, 1 Corinthians. And what we discovered is, in last week's sermon, that there was division within the congregation at Corinth. They had gathered into various factions within the church, different cliques, if you will, and it was caused, at least to some degree, by their misunderstanding of baptism. We discovered last week that many of the people in Corinth had the mistaken idea that baptism in water is what saves a person. And as a result, they were ascribing their salvation, at least to some degree, to the pastor or the preacher who baptized them or at least led them to be baptized. But the Bible clearly teaches that Baptism is merely a symbolic expression, a declaration, a public proclamation of something that actually happens in your heart spiritually and it is invisible. It is the rebirth, new generation. When a person accepts the calling of God by faith and surrenders to Him in repentance and receives the Lord Jesus into their heart, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within their lives, and they are baptized by the Holy Spirit, as the Bible says. They are purified by the fire of God, which comes and takes residence in their life so that they are reborn. Jesus said you must be born again. We call that regeneration. Beloved, that is the moment of salvation. God extends His grace to a person, they receive it by faith, and they accept Jesus, and they are saved. Water baptism occurs later, and it is merely 
a symbolic expression of that which has already taken place in the heart. Baptism doesn't save a person. It is a declaration that they have been saved and thereby identifies them with the church and with Christ himself. Regardless of the reason, there was division in the church. And division in the church oftentimes lead, leads to devastating consequences. I can tell you, in my lifetime, I have seen multiple churches split. I have seen churches severely decline as a result of unresolved and oftentimes just stupid division over meaningless things. Beloved, when Christians quarrel and contend with each other, they misrepresent Jesus. Amen. Jesus is not divided. And when we misrepresent Jesus, we also disparage his holy name. We are the ambassadors of Christ. We are the representatives of Christ on this earth, and we should therefore represent him properly. And division erodes our representation of Christ. Furthermore, it damages our own witness and our own fruitfulness. And for this reason, Paul urged the Corinthian believers, as we looked at last week, to be of one accord, to set aside their foolish divisions and differences, and to come together and share of the same mind and the same judgment. Beloved, such unity should be characteristic of all churches, locally as a congregation and then also as an association and as an area as we come together and cooperate, whether it be the church local or whether it be the church universal, there should be a spirit of unity. However, this morning we're going to move to a second issue. We talked about this the, that last week. This week we're going to discover there was another problem prevalent in the Corinthian church, and that was their tendency to abide by worldly wisdom rather than godly wisdom. Now, just briefly, let me give you a, a, a quick comparison. Worldly wisdom focuses on what is best for and pleasing to oneself. What can I get for me? What can I get for mine? What can I get for us? I'll be honest with you. Worldly wisdom can and often does lead to success in this life. That's why it's called worldly wisdom. But my friends, it makes no investment whatsoever in eternity. None. In fact, worldly or conventional wisdom, as it is sometimes called, is generally, usually, most of the time, in direct contrast with godly wisdom. Usually they are diametrically opposed to each other. That's because godly wisdom begins with fearing the Lord and abiding by His Word. And godly wisdom is selfless. Godly wisdom places the needs of others before oneself. And godly wisdom looks forward to and makes investments and prepares one for eternal life in heaven. Godly wisdom is focused on the life to come, whereas worldly wisdom is focused on the present reality life now. Now it stands to reason, this is not rocket science, is it, that the secular world around us, our culture, it operates with and by worldly wisdom. People, individually, corporately, Businesses, collectively, they, they strive to be successful and influential and profitable in this present life. And that's not necessarily a bad thing to some degree, but we have to be careful because it can be very easy, very easy, for the church to get caught up in this materialistic mindset. To kind of get 
lost in, in the rat race, if you will, of our culture. And to begin to view success in terms of the world instead of in terms of God. So in this morning's message, we are going to read Paul's comparison in this passage of God's wisdom versus the world's wisdom. And we will see at the conclusion his advice about which we should follow, which I bet you can already guess. But if you have your outlines, let's turn there. And point number one is called God's wisdom seems foolish to the world. God's wisdom seems foolish to the world. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know him, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Paul begins by stating in 1 Corinthians 1.18, which is a good verse to memorize, by the way, that the word of the cross, that is, the gospel message, the good news of Jesus Christ, the word of the cross seems foolish to those who are perishing. In other words, lost people, those who reject the good news of Jesus, perceive it to be absurd. Yeah, right. A man was killed, slain, crucified, put in a grave, and he rose from the grave. How stupid can you Christians be? People don't raise from the grave. What an absurdity. People who reject the message of the cross perceive it as foolishness. But on the other hand, the verse says those who have accepted Christ and are being saved regard the same message, the gospel, as the power of God. Amen. You remember what Paul wrote to the church at Rome? Romans 1.16, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe, to the Jew and also to the Greek. So we have a disparity of perception. The world sees the gospel as foolishness, but those who are being saved see it as the power of God unto salvation. Notice that it says believers are being saved. Now this is kind of a, a side point, but let me make it since we're here. We've talked about this before. Salvation is not just a thing that happened in the past. Not, when I was nine years old, I went down the front and I prayed a prayer and I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and I got saved and, and, and my salvation, that's it. No, it's not. It's not what the Bible teaches the Bible says that salvation is a process. What does that mean? Well, it means, yes, you were saved when you accepted Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit came to live in your life, like we talked about just a while ago. You were baptized by the Holy Spirit. You were born again. You were regenerated. You were placed into the family of God. You were saved, but beloved, every single day, every moment of every day, we are being sanctified by the Spirit of God. We are being continually set apart. We are continually being shaped and molded and matured into the image of Christ. We are being saved. And, I've got more good news, someday, long after we 
are dead are dead and gone, and our and our soul is going to be with the Lord in heaven, and our body is lying in the grave, decaying. One of these days, He's going to come back. We're going to come back with Him. The Bible says that our bodies will be raised incorruptible and imperishable. They will be heavenly bodies made for eternity, and they will be rejoined with our souls that have been bodiless during that time. And we will dwell together, body and spirit, as human beings with the Lord forever. And we call that glorification the culmination of our salvation when even our bodies are saved. Salvation is a process. We are saved, we're being saved, and we will be saved. Praise God. Let's get back to the larger topic at hand, wisdom. He says, those who are being saved. Beloved, those who embrace worldly wisdom look down on Christians. Perhaps you've noticed this in the news media. Perhaps you've noticed it in our world. Those who embrace worldly wisdom think that Christians are naive, they're misguided, and silly and frankly they're just flat ignorant they believe in fairy tales well Paul cites the Old Testament prophet in verse 19 and declares that God will ultimately destroy those who follow worldly wisdom turn with me if you will quickly to Isaiah 29 Isaiah 29 verse 14 I'll read you the verse that Paul uses verse 14 it says Therefore, behold, I will once again deal marvelously with this people, wondrously marvelous, and listen to this part, and the wisdom of their wise men will perish, and the discernment of their discerning men will be concealed. Paul uses that last part there of Isaiah and repeats it here, changing uh, maybe just the word but not the meaning uh, to cleverness in my translation, but it's a citation of Isaiah, saying that God will ultimately... Destroy those who follow worldly wisdom. Yeah. No man, no scribe, no scholar or debater equipped solely with worldly wisdom will be able to stand before God. Yeah. Because the Lord, did you see that in verse 20? The Lord has made the world's wisdom foolishness. Yeah. Now don't miss the irony here. Don't miss it. Those who embrace worldly wisdom wrongly view godly wisdom as foolishness when in fact <laughs> it is worldly wisdom that God has made foolishness. Yeah. You see that? The world calls Christians fools, but in fact God has made the world fools. God in His infinite wisdom created a world, verse 21, that could not and did not and does not come to know him using their own conventional wisdom. It is impossible, hear me, it is impossible to come to a saving knowledge of God solely by the use of human intellect. You can't do it. You might intellectually know facts about God, you might intellectually be able to quote scripture and tell Bible stories and possibly even engage in debate about them. You can be a, a, a biblical professor and still not have a saving knowledge of God. Because the world cannot come to know Him through conventional wisdom. Instead, those who come to God must set aside worldly wisdom and accept that which seems to be, by worldly standards, ridiculous and foolish. You see, my friends, godly wisdom requires faith. <laughs> faith to believe that Jesus Christ is risen. Faith to believe that he has paid the debt of man's sin. Amen. Faith to believe that he has secured man's pardon. Amen. And that in him and him alone, sinners can have forgiveness and salvation. 
This is the foolishness of the cross. The power of God unto salvation. God's wisdom seems foolish to the world. Second point is, God's wisdom is greater than the world's. Let's pick up in verse 22. For indeed, Jews ask for signs, and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Paul's message of Christ's crucifixion was generally dismissed by the overwhelming majority of both Jews and Gentiles. As we stated, they, they perceive Paul as spewing fallacies and, and fairy tales. The Jews were looking for signs, wonders, miracles. They were looking for visible displays of power to serve as an affirmation of their Messiah. To visibly demonstrate the power of God. In fact, Matthew 12, 38, you remember the Jews were asking Jesus to show them a sign. As if he hadn't already showed them enough. They needed one more to verify. You ever done that? I just need one more sign. Give, give me one more sign, God. Get this, I'm, I'm still not sure. Give me one more. And Jesus said this. No more signs will be given. None except for the prophet Jonah. You remember the prophet Jonah? He was in the belly of the well for three days. That's, that's your sign. Here's your sign. It was an allusion to Jesus' death, burial in the grave for three days, and his resurrection. There's your sign. But the Jews wanted signs. The Greeks, on the other hand, the Gentiles, were seeking philosophy and and reason and intellectual uh, uh, prowess to demonstrate the wisdom of God. You remember the, your, your world history, perhaps in school, the Greeks uh, championed people like Plato and Socrates and these great intellectual thinkers and philosophers and, and debaters. And you remember they would gather at places like the Parthenon to just sit around and, and talk uh, these, these intellectual discussions and debates. I call it coffee shop theology. <laughs> but that's what they were looking for. That's what they found. By the way, this is clearly demonstrated in the Gospels. The Gospel of Matthew, which was written by Matthew, a Jew, to Jews, focuses heavily on miracles. There are more miracles documented in Matthew than any of the other Gospels. Why? Because his Jewish audience was seeking signs. The Gospel of Luke, which was written by a, a converted Gentile to Christianity, was written and it was sanctioned to be written. It was sanctioned by a Gentile to be written to the Gentiles. And you know what? There are more parables and teachings in that book than any other of the Gospels. Because... He, was, he knew his audience. They were seeking teaching and pet parables and wisdom. But here's the, here's the crazy thing. Paul says to the church of Corinth, which had some Jews and, and Gentiles mixed together, that the message of the cross was a stumbling block to the Jews and it was an absurdity to the Gentiles. It didn't have a, a, a hook on either one of them necessarily. However, to those who are called... To those who have heard the calling of God and accepted the Lord's forgiveness and received the offer of salvation that he makes available, Jesus Christ is both the power of God, that is, the miracles for the Jews, and he is the wisdom of God for the Gentiles. Jesus is both. Jesus' resurrection, my friends, is the ultimate display of God's power. And the gospel message is the, is the supreme stoke, stroke 
of the Lord's wisdom. And so using kind of a play on words, Paul says, the foolishness of God, God's not foolish. It's just a play on words. The foolishness of God as it's perceived by the world. The foolishness of God is wiser than all of the world's so-called wisdom. And in the same way, the weakness of God, and again, no such thing exists. God is not weak. God is never weak. God does not get tired. God didn't rest on the seventh day because he was tired. <laughs> he rested to admire all that he had created. The Lord does not get tired. But again, it's just a, it's just kind of a, a euphemism, a, a, a literary device. The weakness of God is even still stronger than all of men's strength put together. The Old Testament prophet Isaiah, who we mentioned a while ago, wrote, God's thoughts are higher than man's thoughts. God's ways are higher than man's ways. That's why sometimes when things are going on, we don't understand why. Well, guess what? <laughs> That's because God is here and we're here. Isaiah also wrote in chapter 40, verse 28, that the understanding of God is inscrutable. That's a word we don't use very much anymore, but inscrutable basically means we can't understand it. We can't fathom it. God's intellect, God's wisdom, God's knowledge is so much greater than ours, we cannot even begin to grasp it. And when we try to, this is when we get ourselves in trouble. <laughs> we have to just accept it by faith. God knows what he's doing. He doesn't need our approval and permission. God's wisdom is greater than the world's. Our final point this morning is boast in the Lord. Let's finish the chapter. We're in verse 26. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised things God has chosen. The things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are. So that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that just as it is written let him who boast boast in the Lord after presenting his comparison between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom in the preceding verses that we've just discussed now we come to verse 26 where he says, okay, now let's take and apply this. I want you to consider your own call. He asked the Corinthians to pause for a minute and reflect upon when they came to Jesus. When the Lord called to them. Consider who you were at that moment. Both as an individual and collectively as the church there in Corinth. He says, quite frankly, <laughs> there weren't many geniuses among you. There weren't very many university scholars in your midst. Now, don't get me wrong, he's not insulting them. He's not calling them stupid. He's just pointing out a fact. There weren't, you know, a lot of a lot of just brilliant academics in the group. He goes on to say, and there weren't many, uh, you know, decorated soldiers or, or mighty valiant warriors or great champions in the group either. Weren't a lot of war heroes present among you. Weren't a lot of mighty folks. And then he goes on a bit further and says, 
And there were few, if, if any, wealthy elites who had, you know, privileged social status or, or nobility or had some kind of an exalted, you know, favor in the eyes of the upper echelons of society. He said, consider your calling. The reality is, you're just everyday folks. That's not an insult. In fact, it's a compliment. There's nothing about you in the eyes of the world that makes you particularly special or extraordinary. You're just common everyday people just like everybody else. Except you have been called by God, have surrendered to Him, and you have been chosen to be His church in your town. You have been set apart. Not because anybody thinks special about you, but all because of Jesus. You see, God chooses the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. He chooses the weak things of the world to overpower the strong. <laughs> he chooses the base and despised things to shame those which are exalted and magnified. And He uses the things that are not to nullify the things that are. This is the paradoxical nature of God. In the eyes of the world, it doesn't make sense. It's a paradox. But this is the way God functions and the way God operates. In accordance with his divine wisdom. God has chosen regular folks. Just like you and me. People who make mistakes. People who fall down and skin their knees. People who cry. And are ashamed. He uses regular folks. Imperfect and broken as the recipients of his righteousness, of his sanctification, and of redemption through Jesus Christ. And therefore, therefore, there is nothing, nothing in and of ourselves, and in fact nothing in the whole world that we can boast about. Nothing. Boasting means to talk with excessive pride and self-satisfaction about one's own achievements or possessions or abilities. One of the reasons I don't get on social media is because I feel like it's a boasting contest. Everybody is celebrating and, and showing all of these things about their life, and whether it's true or not, oftentimes I feel like some of it is like, oh, look how good my life is compared to yours. Beloved, there's nothing in this life, nothing worthy of boasting about. Because everything that we have that is good, that is valuable, and that is lasting and eternal comes from God. It's all due to Him. Paul cites the ancient prophet Jeremiah. Earlier he cited Isaiah. Now he's going to cite Jeremiah. Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 9. We'll read verses 23 and 24. Jeremiah wrote, But let him who boasts boast of this. I'm sorry, verse 23 and 24. I said the wrong verse. Verses 23 and 24 of Jeremiah chapter 9. Thus saith the Lord, Let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, let not a mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth, for I delight in these things, declares the Lord. Paul writes to the church in Corinth twice. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 29, and again in verse 
31, he simplifies and shortens and surmises the words of the prophet Jeremiah when he writes, Let he who boasts, boast in the Lord. My friends, worldly wisdom is a road to death and judgment. But godly wisdom leads to light and life. And so as we begin to wrap up our message this morning with the few minutes we have left, let me just again state, in addition to their theological misunderstanding of baptism, the, the, the vision that plagued the church at Corinth that Paul is addressing in this chapter and through chapter 4, we'll be dealing with this issue of division. It was also fueled in part by pride, arrogance, and worldly wisdom. Many people within the congregation were focused upon themselves and their own little cliques and their own little groups and their needs rather than upon Christ and upon one another. And their misplaced confidence in the world's wisdom aggravated their situation and amplified their division even more. But as we close, let me just touch the major points that Paul has made in this passage. First, the world views godly wisdom and the gospel and the message of the cross as foolishness. But it is not foolishness. The world thinks Christianity is nonsense. Hear me. This deception is by design. God intended for it to be that way. So that seeing they would not see and hearing they would not hear. Second, the truth of the gospel and godly wisdom is far greater than worldly wisdom. And it is personified in the person of Jesus Christ who is both the power of God and the wisdom of God. The Savior who died to atone for the sins of mankind. And third... God has chosen the foolish and weak things of this world to shame the wise and the strong, that he might reveal the futility of boasting in earthly things, so that those who boast should boast in the Lord. Perhaps there's somebody here this morning, present here in this sanctuary, or perhaps watching and listening online. Perhaps you have been trusting in and, and living by worldly wisdom. Perhaps it's brought you some temporal success, and I hope that it has. There's nothing wrong with enjoying some success in this life, and we all need that. Maybe some prosperity. I hope so. But my friend, let me warn you, the wisdom of this world will never satisfy the longing of your heart. It cannot and will not fulfill the purpose for which you are created. The Bible says that God has set eternity in the heart of every man. He has created us to desire something beyond this world. That's why from the dawn of civilization, man has always worshipped something. Because there is an innate, created impulse within us that something out there exists bigger than us. And beloved, that something is God Almighty Amen. and His Son, Jesus Christ. And you can never fill that void within you through worldly wisdom. You cannot. Amen. Only godly wisdom can do that. And that begins, as the Bible says, by fearing the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the Bible says. And so, if that describes you, I encourage you this morning to lay aside worldly wisdom. Forget what the world has taught you about what it means to be a success and to be prosperous and to be Mighty. And instead, I encourage you, as did the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians, to embrace and receive the foolishness of the cross. I love that wordplay. 
the foolishness of the cross. Because, beloved, it's not foolish at all. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this opportunity we have to be here in your house to proclaim your word. Lord, I pray, Lord, that if there's any person here within the sound of my voice, either present here physically with us or online, God, that your spirit would move within their heart and you would draw them to yourself during this time. And they would respond to your gospel call during this invitation. For we ask it in Jesus' name.